Hi everyone, my name is Yimin Tio. I'm a clinical and private practice dietitian specializing in digestive health at Herbs and Food. Thank you to IBD Club for the invitation to present. I'll be sharing about dietary management of adults with IBD, the emerging role of dietary therapy. This article serves as a comprehensive review that defines the full scope of a dietitian's function in IBD care. It proposes a four-step approach in dietitian's assessment and management of nutrition among IBD patients, as well as update a clinical guide based on newer evidence in nutrition therapy. Here are the proposed four steps of IBD dietary management per the article and will be elaborated in the upcoming slides. When managing nutritional needs among IBD patients, we have to keep in mind the high proportions of body composition abnormalities. BMI is therefore not an accurate sole nutritional marker given the high rates of progressive muscle loss even among normal BMI patients during both remission and active disease. With increased sarcopenia, there is increase in fatigue and lower quality of life. There is also emerging data on the correlation between visceral adiposity with increased inflammation and post-op complications among Crohn's patients. Recommendations in this review include considering the usage of body composition analysis or a bioimpedance analysis and grip strength, which correlates well with imaging among IBD patients. There are high rates of several micronutrient deficiencies which should be corrected as necessary. When making nutrition recommendations, dietary intake patterns adequacy should be taken into consideration as well. We have seen effects of nutrition therapy in inducing remission among IBD patients. However, more work needs to be done to identify specific dietary components that drive inflammation. Figuring out the root cause of where symptoms are coming from and using objective markers of inflammation to assess response to dietary therapy will be important. This table summarizes the dietary therapy that have been used for induction therapy, maintenance therapy, or both, along with each of their corresponding level of efficacy based on current studies available. Based on this review, exclusive enteral nutrition and Crohn's disease exclusion diet have the most robust level of evidence for their usage as induction therapy for Crohn's patients. Even though it's effective, we see lower efficacy rates among adults for EEN, likely due to poor adherence and the restrictive nature, especially in social settings. CDED is emerging as a better tolerated alternative therapy that allows patients to still have real food along with partial enteral nutrition with similar results. EEN is not currently routinely used in ulcerative colitis patients due to limited data. For patients in remission, there is no strong evidence to show the need and benefits for continued dietary restrictions. This table is a great summary showing dietary management strategies based on the etiology of non-inflammatory symptoms identified. The degree of intestinal inflammation can be assessed with various methods and be used to guide the optimization of anti-inflammatory therapy. When it comes to the low-fiber diet, it should not be the blanket go-to recommendation for all IBD patients. Based on the current data available, fiber restriction is only shown to be effective among patients with strictures in managing symptoms. Ways to reduce risk for surgical complications post-op, including optimizing nutritional status pre-op, using EEN whenever appropriate, and addressing malnutrition. EBRAS programs also helps in reducing post-op morbidity and mortality rates. There is more significant benefits seen among Crohn's patients compared to ulcerative colitis patients based on this review. As for dietary therapy after surgery, there is no specific diets that are recommended. Patients with new ostomies are recommended to avoid certain foods to help with gas and output, and there is currently limited evidence and recommendations for patients with J-pouch or experiencing active pouchitis. Given the high rates of disorder eating pattern among IBD patients observed, it is important to screen for eating disorder risk during assessments, refer to dietitian for further intervention, as well as obtain mental health support if eating disorder risk is suspected. Given the inconsistent evidence on utilizing specific diets in IBD prevention, it is recommended in this review to continue encouraging healthy eating principles among the general population. In conclusion, diet has become an important part of IBD management in controlling disease symptoms and complications. Having a dietitian who has the knowledge of implementing appropriate dietary therapies for IBD management, utilizing more relevant biomarkers and tools as part of the assessment process, addressing malnutrition, eating disorder risk, and micronutrient deficiencies will help improve overall clinical outcomes.